recording. Um, Multi-level models part two. Last week we talked about fitting models with varying intersects, right? We talked about how it's a good idea to partially pool parameter estimates when our uh, units that we're looking at kind of come from the same population, right? So if we have a group of observations that all come from the same population, um, you know, we could fit intercepts to each of those units separately in what's typically called the fixed effects approach. Um, but when we do that, we kind of treat them as if they all come from a different population. We treat them as if they all don't uh, have information that's useful in fitting the intercepts for other units. So we developed the multi-level model approach, the partial pooling approach, which says, no, let's, let's go ahead and put a probability distribution on those intercepts. And let's say that they all have the same mean. Let's say that they have, uh, when we look at the population of them, they have a standard deviation, right? And we proposed a normal, but there's other models we can use for that. And we said that the intercepts that describe the average values for each of those units follows a probability distribution. And so when we do that, it allows us to learn about the population at the same time as it allows us to estimate within unit models, right? So then we get cool things like variance parameter estimates, but we also get the benefit of not overfitting our data, right? Uh, we get the benefit of uh, regularizing our estimates and pulling them in a bit, right? We know that in the Bayesian framework, we use our priors to pull in estimates a bit toward our prior, right? Depending on the strength of the data. Hey, Dorothy. Uh, it, it, and, but at the same time, uh, we can use the multi-level model to kind of further that benefit by regularizing our estimates toward the population. So we can regular, regularize it both toward the prior, but also toward the population mean. So those extreme estimates are gonna get pulled in a little bit and that can be really useful, right? And it turns out, right, we worked a simulation example where we showed that if you simulate data that comes from this kind of process, that the multi-level model does a better job of predicting out those group means than does that fixed effects approach, right? Um, so, uh, you know, when you see uh, data that has a structure to it, that has levels, that has a hierarchical structure or has clear clusters or groupings. Uh, I suggest, and Miguel Rath suggests, that a multi-level model should be what you turn to, right? That we can use those kind of classical intercepts and, uh, you know, as a way to model this, but, but that's going to overfit the data in most cases, right? And when we have a lot of data, the multi-level estimate is going to converge to that estimate. Right when the data overwhelms the prior, it's going to converge to that anyway. If we have, for example, 100 observations per unit, then that fixed effects approach and the multi level approach are going to give you indistinguishable um, inferences anyway. Okay, so today we're going to generalize that and we're going to move beyond intercepts to include slopes, right? So, what if we have data where we not only want to model the average level for each unit, but we also want to model some rate of change? Uh, for that unit, and we want to fit those within units. So let's kind of think through this. We can think about the variable slope approach as being similar to an interaction model, right? So imagine that we go back to our Gapminder data, and I uh, set um, an interaction of year for each country. So I, 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 this is a fixed effects, what we can call a fixed effect growth model, right? Uh, where I give an intercept for each country that's not partially pooled, and I give a slope for each country over time, right? So I allow each country to have its own uh, increase in life expectancy over time. And, and boo boo butt babies, apparently. Um, at the same time, you can see, right, each country has a different kind of growth trajectory. Um, now, these are not partially pooled. So effectively, what I'm doing is I'm estimating a separate model for each country. Hey, Dorothy. I appreciate that you want to say silly words, but let's try and keep it quiet, please. Um, uh, so effectively, what we're doing is we're taking here, we have 12 observations per country, and we're fitting... 150 separate regression models, in effect, uh, where each model gets its own intercept and slope. 
right? So we can do this, but it's highly inefficient. And because we uh, then only have 12 data points for each country that we're estimating, uh, we're gonna be overfitting, right? We typically overfit when we don't have a lot of data. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of generalize our partial pooling approach to think about how we can use the population of countries to smooth out some of these extreme deviations that we might get, some of this overfitting that we might get. And remember, overfitting is bad uh, because it weakens our ability to predict new cases well, right? And it also pulls our estimates further away from the truth if we think of the truth as, as um, you know, the, the data generating process, the thing that actually drives these things, right? That, that if we were to simulate these out, this partial, this this no pooling approach, right? This is equivalent to a no pooling approach with a slope, uh, will uh, kind of be biased, right, uh, relative to the, the the partial pooling approach. Simulation. Frank, yeah, uh, what's what's the source of the overfitting here? Is it because we're doing a model for each set of units? It's like adding the too many parameters. Uh, sort of, yeah, it's, it's it's comparable to adding too many parameters, right? We only have 12 data points when we do this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to draw the best fit line for the 12 data points, but when we compare it to the population of countries, we're going to end up with really extreme variations, right? The model's going to work really hard to fit the best model within that country, right? Uh, but what you're going to get if you compare this to the partial pooling is the the uh, the, the magnitude of those slopes and intercepts will be more extreme than it will in the partial pooling approach. So this is going to pull those in a little bit. And the, we can think of this as, um, you know, overfitting is a problem. We, we, we kind of try and draw too much information when we don't have enough data. Or we make our inferences too strong when we don't have enough data. So oh, the, the risk of overfitting decreases if we, for example, had 100 observations for each country, right? But with only 12, um, this approach is basically going to allow the data to overwhelm our inference, and we're going to end up with more extreme slopes than maybe we should. If we think that, for example, all countries come from a population of countries, maybe we want to borrow information to help us estimate those slopes. But overfitting means that, for example, uh, this approach makes it incredibly difficult for me to predict, okay, let's say one country wasn't included in the data and I want to know something about its um, growth and life expectancy over time. This model gives me no information on how to predict that for that country. This model doesn't tell me much about how to predict what is the average country's trajectory. I can't do that here, right? Because I fit a separate model for each country. So I'd have to choose one country to stand in as the average because it overfit each it's because it fits separate models for each country. So it makes it really difficult to make inferences about the population of uh, interest here. Where it, while it might give me really precise estimates within a country, it uh, yeah makes predicting a new unit maybe more difficult. And uh, we could, we could uh, I'd need to maybe run the simulations, but it probably also would predict a new year more poorly for each country. <laughs> Because kind of pulling those in, I mean, you know, regression to the mean is a phenomenon, right? We have more extreme observations, more extreme kind of slopes. Uh, over time, those are going to pull in a bit, right? Uh, over time, those more those those extreme observations are going to become uh, less likely, right? If we have an extreme over these twelve cases, the next case, uh, the next you know twelve cases are probably going to be less extreme. Um, but we'll kind of leave that for now. Uh, does that answer your question, Orin, about overfitting? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, sure. Any other questions about the kind of general motivation here and about what the no pooling model is doing in this case? We're getting 150 lines. None of them share anything with each other. Right? So that's, that's what we got here. We got a model with 150 lines. None of them have anything in common with the others. They don't share information as we estimate them. Right, we just take those 12 data points for each country and fit a separate regression model to it, in effect. Okay, so let's partially pool slopes. So an interaction model, which is kind of the, the, the varying slopes model is effectively an engine to produce big interaction models like what we just did, right? Where we interact country with year and we get a separate slope for each. 
The varying slopes approach is effectively an engine to do that, but we can partially pool those slopes, right? Just as we drew a probability distribution that we could sample intercepts from, we can draw a probability distribution and sample slopes from it as well, right? Uh, so we're gonna do the same thing. The, 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 the sort of information about the growth of country life expectancy over time is now gonna be something that we get information about from the model and that we sample our slopes from adaptively. Right in the same way we adaptively sampled um, intercepts out of the population of country intercepts. So the the fixed effects approach right constrains our modeling. The other the other kind of upside to the multi level approach is uh, because of uh, degrees of freedom right we can't actually include things that are not time varying in this no pooling approach. For example, if I fit this model, I can't make any inferences about continent. I can't include a continent indicator, and I can't include continent level predictors. And I also can't include country level predictors that don't change over time. It's a continent, right? You know, uh, Zambia is not changing continents midway through this period, right? Uh, so anything that doesn't vary over time in the no pooling approach, we can't actually get information about because if we're restricting it to those 12 observations and we're not getting information from anywhere else, how can I learn what the impact of being in Europe is on Switzerland? if I don't observe any other countries, right? If I'm not getting information on any other countries, I can't actually use that information in a regression model. But in the partial pooling approach, I definitely can, right? So if you have a situation where you have interest in something that doesn't change over time within a unit, then the partial pooling approach is your default anyway, right? Uh, so all that is, you know, there's, we could have much kind of longer conversations about approaches to panel data and approaches to time series and longitudinal data and their, you know, modeling strategies. But what we're getting into today is a way to think about measuring growth over time. It's, it's the kind of classic approach of, of how I use this, but it can be more generalized to any time where we have differences or slopes on something that we want to consider. Okay. Uh, the partial pooling technique, right, is going to estimate that probability distribution, and we get the benefits of regularizing those estimates. We get parameters for the population we can use for inference, and we've got a lot more flexibility in our models than we do in the no pooling approach. So this no pooling approach is really common, uh, again, in econometrics, right? If you think about like a difference in difference design, this is a no pooling approach, right? If we think about um, you know, various kinds of fixed effects designs, longitudinal fixed effects designs, that is a no pooling approach, where there's no information about units that goes across them. Right? Uh, we're effectively measuring the change within a unit over time by estimating separate models for each unit. And the difference in it, uh, you know, the, the treatment in that case would be whatever the, the, the slope in that case would be whatever the treatment of interest is uh, over time, but we won't get too much into dip and dip. Let's set up this coffee shops example. Uh, so for those of you who are up to date on the reading, we'll just be kind of working that first example exactly from the book. Uh, okay, so uh, we kind of have this scenario where we imagine that we want to learn something about coffee shop wait times, right? Uh, and we know that coffee shops are going to have different wait times in the morning and the afternoon, right? So if I want to go get my latte, uh, you know, not that it would work very well these days. Uh, this is actually kind of depressing because I miss my coffee shop. Black Swan, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, so waiting for, you know, coffee in the morning might take you 10 minutes, but if you go in at two o'clock, the line isn't really going to be as long, right? Uh, so they have different wait times in the morning and afternoon. And we can think about the difference between morning and afternoon wait times as a slope, right? We can expect generally coffee shops are going to have lower wait times in the afternoon than in the morning. So we get a negative slope there, right? And we also think that there might be a correlation between these two things right? That there's a floor effect here. You can't have, you know, less than a 30 second wait for your coffee or one minute wait for your coffee, depending on what you order, just based on how long it takes to make the drink, right? And the minimum possible would be zero. So a coffee shop with small wait times in the morning will also have small wait times in the afternoon, right? But a coffee shop with long wait times in the morning has a lot farther to fall towards zero, right? Uh, so we expect that the, the slope and the intercept should be correlated here, right? Those coffee shops with long wait times 
in the morning should have a greater distance to fall, should have a greater difference between morning and afternoon wait times, right? Um, as opposed to those that have, you know, short wait times in the morning, don't have very far to fall, so their afternoon wait time won't be very much different. We could think of this as a floor effect, right? Because you can't go below zero, you can't have negative wait times. So we're going to pool information here, right? Because presumably coffee shops are similar in important ways, right? Each one's going to be a little different in how they do things uh, and in how popular they are, but they all come from the same population. They all kind of have the same set of machines. They usually have the same kind of layout, right? They have similar menus. Um, but so in this case, uh, we're going to pool information both on their morning wait time, but also on the difference between the morning and afternoon wait time. But the key difference of what we're going to do today is we want to bake these correlations in, right? We want to think that uh, we want to allow our model to know that the alpha for our intercepts and the beta for our slope are probably related to each other, right? We want there to be correlation amongst our regression parameters, or at least we want to allow for that, right? And we want to say, you know, if I learn something about alpha, I'm probably also learning something about beta, and we want that to be part of our model. So we're going to need a little bit of new technology to make that work. First, we're going to simulate this data. Uh, so we're going to say that the uh, average wait time in the morning is three and a half minutes. The average difference between morning and if I subtract afternoon from morning, it's going to be negative one. The average variance in morning wait times, or the average standard deviation in morning wait times is going to be one. So we're going to imagine a normal 3.51. And the average uh, difference in this difference, so how variable this difference is across coffee shops, is going to be 0 0.5. But we're going to add this extra parameter in here called rho. Now rho is the correlation, right? Uh, the Greek letter rho typically stands in for correlation. We're going to say that there's a correlation between a and b of minus 0.7, right? So we expect that uh, as we see higher morning wait times, we should see uh, a lower uh, more more in magnitude lower, right? So we should see higher negative values for beta when we have higher positive values for alpha, right? We should see this negative slope. Uh, so the technology we need to do this is a covariance matrix. Uh, so a covariance matrix is a compact way for us to express relationships among variables. A lot of us have seen correlation matrices before, right? And this is a really similar thing. Uh, what we have in a covariance matrix is Let's imagine that this is the column for alpha and this is the column for beta. So in the diagonal, we express the covariance of a variable with itself, right? So our linear model here is y equals alpha plus beta x. So we have two random variables. We have alpha and we have beta, right? Alpha is a random slope, beta is a random intercept. And we're gonna give them normal priors, right? Uh, so what we're, the covariance of a variable with itself is its variance. Right, so how does a variable vary with itself? That's just a definition of the variance. Uh, so that's sigma squared alpha in this case, and sigma squared beta here. Now in the off diagonals, we get the covariance, which I'm writing here as a factored form because that's what we're going to use in the priors. Uh, you could express it typically with COV alpha comma beta, right? Uh, but in this case, we're going to say that the standard deviation of alpha times the standard deviation of beta times rho this little Greek character is rho, uh, alpha beta, so the correlation between alpha and beta, the standard deviation of alpha times the standard deviation of beta times the correlation of the two variables gives us their covariance. And notice that this is equal, right, on the off diagonal. On the diagonal, we have the variance of the two variables, and on the off diagonal, it's symmetric. So really, we only need the top or the bottom triangle here. This is going to be redundant. Now we could generalize this to more dimensions, right? So we could have three variables where we could have a sigma squared alpha, sigma squared beta, sigma squared gamma. And then we could have over here the correlation of alpha with gamma and then the correlation of beta with gamma on the diagonal, right? So there's no reason it needs to be two by two. It could be, it's always gonna be, uh, it's always gonna be square, 
right? It's always going to be, uh, you know, two by two or three by three, depending on four by four, depending on how many variables we have. It's going to be symmetric. Uh, but yeah, this is the covariance matrix. And so we could think of this as giving us effectively the variance of each measure and it's crudely speaking, a measure that's proportional to the correlation with the other variable, right? The covariance is proportional to the, cor the correlation. The covariance is effectively an unscaled version of the correlation, right? So we've, we've seen these correlation matrices before probably. And we know that a correlation of a measure with itself is always one, right? A uh, measure can't be, it's perfectly correlated with itself. If you plot a measure against itself, you get a straight line, right? Uh, and then here we have row, alpha, beta. I just put the subscript on there to indicate, right, what two measures are correlated with each other. So we have row on the diagonals. And again, this is going to be symmetric. So th these two are related to each other, right? Uh, the the correlation matrix, right, the, these uh, correlations are uh, scaled versions of the covariance, right? So effectively, if we divide this term by sigma alpha, sigma beta, we get rho, and rho is constrained to minus 1, 1, right? Because we know a correlation has to take on values between negative 1 and 1. The correlation is just a scaled covariance, right, where we constrain it to that minus 1, 1 space. So what this matrix is doing is it's giving us information on how variable these things are with it just on their own, right? And then it's giving us how much information we get about one variable by learning something about the other variable, how correlated they are. So if I know that alpha is large and positive, does that tell me anything about the location of beta? Does it tell me that it's large and negative? Does it tell me that it's also large and positive? Or does it tell me nothing, right? Uh, so this is uh, not straightforward, but uh, this is going to be an important piece of how we fit these um, uh, multi-level models with more than one varying parameter, right? Because we want to allow these varying parameters to be correlated with each other. We want to allow this additional complexity into our model. Any questions so far? I'm going to give you a little bit of an, let, let's, let's do the illustrations and see where we're at. So this is, we're going to uh, kind of work through the impact of covariance on a couple random variables here, just by simulating. So let's say we set rho equal to 1, sigma alpha equal to 1, and sigma beta equal to 1, right? So sigma alpha squared is also 1, sigma beta squared is also 1, right? In our covariance matrix, we're usually working with the variance and not the standard deviation. But in this case, setting them to 1 makes this equal to 1 and this equal to 1. They're all equal to one because it makes it easier to work with. Dorothy wanted to know why they're all equal to one. Uh, okay, so um, here we're going to set up uh, our matrix, our covariance matrix, which I'm calling S. You often will see these represented by a capital sigma, right, which is just like the summation operator. Um, so I'm going to set, uh, you know, these equal to one, zero, one, zero, or I'm sorry, zero, one. So it's going to be one on the diagonals and zero on the off diagonals. So if we were to come back to this matrix, right, it's going to be 1, and then these are going to be fixed at 0. So we have 1 variance for both variables and 0 correlation amongst them. We're going to draw these from a multivariate normal distribution, right, because now we have a distribution that's normal in more than one dimension, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, just kind of trust me for now. But we can generalize the normal to have as many dimensions as we like. In this case, we're going to say alpha and beta are jointly normally distributed, and they have a mean expectation given by the vector mu, right? So mu, mu has two values, one for uh, alpha and one for beta. Both are set at zero. And it has a distribution, a variance that's uh, just established by the covariance matrix. So now if we're, 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 we're basically predicting out uh, in two dimensions simultaneously. So we need to know how variable each one is, but we also need to know how much they vary with each other, right? We're giving them a joint distribution. This sounds crazy. It's a little crazy, uh, but we'll kind of work through what this looks like as we go. So let's plot it, right? And so, okay, so the plot, right, is, is um, not especially interesting. And we've seen this kind of scatter plot all the time. We have two variables that are uncorrelated with each other. 
And so there's no slope here, right? Uh, we have effectively a symmetric kind of cloud of points. Yeah. But what happens if I put a little bit of a correlation in the mix, right? So now I'm going to change my matrix up to make those off diagonals equal to 0 0.5. Right, so now we have a 0 0.5 covariance, uh, which is going to be equal to the correlation in this case because the standard deviations are 1. What if we've got a 0 0.5 covariance between the two measures, right? And here, uh, we're going to see that we get a bit of a positive slope, right? Because as A is higher, B is also higher, right? So this normal distribution, this multivariate normal distribution says that if I sample a larger value of A, then that tells me something about the value of B. It must, it, it, it you know, will on average be higher as well, right? And so we can see that this cloud kind of tilts up now. What if I put a negative correlation on here, right? A minus 0.8 correlation. Now we see both the spread shrinks a little bit because the values are more tightly correlated with each other, but we also get that negative slope. Okay, so the covariance matrix is effectively going to impose, you know, various kinds of restrictions on where those variables can go based on our described relationship between them. Is there any questions about what this thing is going to do? We feel okay about it? The math looks hard, but in effect, it's not that much more difficult than what we've been working with all along, right? We just are allowing there to be a joint distribution of multiple variables at once, and we're allowing them to have a correlation structure. But we're going to estimate that from the data, right? Here, we're going to pretend like we know what it is to simulate it, but later we're going to recover it directly from the data. So here's how we use this. Uh, oh, right. One other thing. Um, in the, the way that um, we're going to parameterize our models is we're going to effectively factor the correlation matrix out so we can give it its own prior. Um, and so we're going to give two vectors here. We're going to give a vector and a matrix as a way to populate uh, this covariance matrix. First, we're going to give a correlation matrix row. Right, and then we're going to give uh, the sigmas separate, right? Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to use this diag sigmas matrix multiplication row matrix multiplication diag sigmas to accomplish this. What diag try try this line of code on your machine, but what diag of um, a of a vector of two will do is it will give you a matrix where those two values are on the diagonal and zeros are on the off diagonal. So it's effectively going to give you a matrix of standard deviations, um, but the off diagonals are going to be fixed at zero. And so this works out to be the covariance matrix. Don't worry too much about this. This is just kind of a little trick that we're going to use to fit the model that I will take no credit for if this is all my dollar. Okay. So let's simulate our data. Uh, we're going to let mu be equal to a and b, right? We defined a and b earlier. a is 3.5, b is minus 1, and those are just the average values for morning wait time and difference between afternoon and morning wait time. We also defined our sigmas, right? So we get mu. We get, we're going to simulate 2,000 cafes at first. We're going to go back and do 20 later just to make the example a little easier to work. Um, and we're going to use the MVR norm function that comes from the math package. So you should already have it installed, but um, it's a commonly used one. Mass is the one that will screw you up with tidyverse, though, because mass has a select function. So uh, the tidyverse select function will no longer work if you library mass in. So you'll need to uh, either do, um, you'll, you'll need to, I, there's example code in my um, R markdown for how to correct this, but just be aware that you may need to do dplyr colon colon select to get the dplyr version of select, which is the tidyverse function. Um, okay, so now we're going to simulate those, right? We're going to draw 2,000 in cafes, random numbers, with means mu, now we don't have a single mean, we have two means, 
right? We have a mean for A and a mean for B, 3 and minus 1. And we are going to draw with sigma. And remember, we defined sigma here. And sigma is this thing, right? So now we're feeding it not a standard deviation. We're feeding it a covariance matrix, right? Which is a little strange. But uh, what it's going to use for this is it knows that the variance of A is right here, the variance of B is right here, and the covariance of A with B is right here. So that's all it needs to draw those samples, is it needs how variable is A, how variable is B, and how much do they jointly vary with each other, right? And when it has those three pieces of information, because remember that uh, the matrix index, if we think of this as S, right, S comma 1 comma 2 is equal to S comma uh, 2 comma 1, right? These are symmetric on the off diagonal. Yeah, you need to use Goo Goo Gaga. I need to use Goo Goo Gaga, so. Um, okay, so we're going to simulate those and set them up in a data frame. Let's see what this looks like. Okay, so this is the distribution of 2,000 hypothetical cafes that follow this relationship. Now, we see that that negative correlation, right? We established that there is a negative correlation between A and B. That's here, right? We can also put a contour over this. Mikhail Reth uses ellipses in the book to do it, uh, but we can put contours over that. And imagine we're looking at this from above, right? And think of this as like a terrain map, right? Uh, think of that center, this, this circle in the middle as being the highest point. And think of each of these lines indicating a sort of topography that goes down. So imagine this in three dimensions, right? Which actually looks like this, right? So that center, this is hard to look at, and we don't typically use 3D plots because it's easier to, once you get your head around what a contour plot looks like, it's easier to look at that. But this is what it looks like in 3D, right? Uh, that we have that highest point in the middle, and this looks like a normal curve, right? Just if we kind of pulled it up and squished it in a little bit. Um, so this is a normal distribution uh, plotted as a density in three dimensions, right? A density plot typically takes one vector and plots it in 2D, so now we're taking a two-dimensional vector and plotting it with an additional third dimension. So this sounds crazy, but there's no reason we can't do this for a 20-dimensional multivariate normal. We just can't visualize that at all, right? Because um, our brains don't work that way. Um, but we can think of this as kind of looking at the mountain from above of this normal, right? So most of the density based on you know, the, the center of those variables is going to be right about here. And we see... Uh, so this is the, the average values for A and B that I've kind of superimposed on it, and we can see where those are, and we can see a slope, right, coming through this. That's uh, a function of the correlation that we've put on there. So questions about this multivariate normal? Are, we feel okay about it? It's kind of weird. It's okay if you have questions. But this is a piece of technology we're going to use a lot, right, once we get into this space. And most of the time it's going to happen behind the scenes and you don't need to think about it too much. But we've moved now from having separate normal distributions for alpha and beta to having a single multivariate normal distribution for alpha and beta. Cool? Cool. Okay, this is just for comparison. What if we had no correlation between A and B? This is what the multivariate normal would look like, right? Similar kind of peak in the middle, uh, but now we don't see that slope, right? The shape uh, in terms of just the, the, the normal shape is going to be similar, but now we don't have an angle imposed on it. Okay, so that was a lot of setup to simulate the data. But the idea here, right, is that we can kind of start to understand the model well if we understand a sort of contrived example where we generate the data from the model we're about to use to recover those estimates, right? We basically just said this has a variable intercept and slope structure. There's correlation between A and B. And if we don't use a model that allows there to be correlations between A and B and doesn't partially pool across the population, we won't recover the uh, accurate parameter estimates, right? Our model won't be as close to uh, the truth, because we know the truth in this case, because we designed the experiment, uh, this is where simulation can be really helpful, right? Is if we think we 
um, have some theory about how a data emerges, about what a data generating process looks like. And we want to think about what's the right modeling approach to recover the truth in this context. Well, we can create these contrived examples to generate the data. We can simulate it and then test different models on it. This is uh, kind of more generally something we could think about as power analysis too, right? We could think about, well, okay, um, if I know what the truth is, how big of a sample do I need to get accurate inferences on this thing? What kind of models will accurately recover the true parameter estimates when I know the truth, right? Because obviously in the real world, we never know the truth. Um, okay, so um, we're gonna kind of rerun the simulation again, but in this time, I'm just gonna constrain visits to be 20. Right, instead of 2000, but otherwise this is the same. And this is what our simulated data look like. We have repeated observations of a cafe at different times. So we, we visit each cafe 10 times, right? And then we're gonna use each of those 10 visits to estimate its slope and its intercepts. Uh, so, we, so we have 200 rows here, I'm sorry, 400 rows here, 20 cafes, 10 visits each. And, oh, I'm sorry, 10 visits afternoon, 10 visits morning each. So we have 400 observations. And then we get average wait times for each. Okay, any questions about this setup before we get into the modeling? Cool. I'm trying to wrap my head around the um, end cafe divided by two. So what exactly are you doing there? I'm just... <laughs> yeah, so we're just saying we're going to visit. Uh, so we have uh, 20 visits, 20 cafes. Uh, so we're gonna have two mm -hmm. visits, one for uh yeah, each in morning and afternoon right it's just okay. populating the matrix with the correct dimensions. don't worry too much about this this is just an arbitrary example we could visit them each 20 times and it'd be fine right yeah arbitrary um the rest of it is just the simulation that we've uh done before okay the wait times are normally distributed right but the uh sigmas and alphas we drew from that multivariate normal early early right there okay um so let's get to the model. So this is our variable slopes model, or at least the first part of it. These are going to get long and uh, and a bit unwieldy as we write the priors out, but that's okay because we know how to work with it. Uh, okay, so wait times follow a normal likelihood, right, with uh, mean mu and standard deviation sigma, but each cafe can have its own wait time and its own average difference between morning and afternoon waits, right? So each cafe has its own average morning wait time because that's the example, because we're trying to figure out how long you have to wait for your coffee. Um, so uh, you can have an average wait time in the morning and each cafe has one. And then you have an average difference between morning and afternoon wait times, right? So we have a beta that's effectively a slope here times an indicator for afternoon, right? This is gonna turn out to be the difference between uh, afternoon and morning wait times. We're going to allow alpha and beta to be jointly distributed, multivariate normal, with mean alpha beta. And instead of a standard deviation, we have our covariance matrix S. Okay, so this is analogous to a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. But instead, now we give a vector of means and a matrix for our covariance. Yeah, do we see how this is analogous? Yeah, that it's it's a, 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 but instead, right? We need now each variable gets a mean that has to be a vector if we have more than one variable, and then we also need uh, each variable needs its own standard deviation, but they also can co-vary with each other. So that must be represented as a matrix in order to include both the standard deviation and the uh, correlation amongst each of them, right? So that's where this guy's going to come back in. So we'll have sigma squared alpha and sigma squared beta on the diagonal and the covariance between alpha and beta on the off diagonal, which remember is just the standard deviation of each variable times each other times the correlation of the variables. So it looks complicated, but it's actually not that complicated. Okay, so that's the first chunk of our model. Questions about that multivariate normal distribution for alpha and beta. That's a likelihood for alpha and beta follows multi multivariate normal, right? And that's where our adaptive prior is going to kick in. Okay. So we're going to parameterize S in a funky way, right? So typically we could write this as sigma squared alpha 
sigma alpha beta, the covariance of alpha and beta, with sigma squared beta on the, so we, we have the variance of alpha and beta on the diagonal, and the covariance of alpha with beta on the off diagonal, and those are equal to each other, right? But we can also factor this, and this is going to help us with setting priors. It's really the only reason we're doing it this way, where we write it again as the diagonal of the vector of uh, the standard deviation of alpha and beta matrix multiplied by some correlation matrix R, which we're going to get from a prior. Don't worry too much about this. If this makes your brain hurt, it makes my brain hurt a little too. It's just a trick of the math that we're going to use to make the machine run, right? This is just engineering. This is not like a concept that you need to deeply understand. You need to understand what this thing is, right? You don't really need to worry too much about this formulation. This is just a convenience that we're going to use to make the model run. So here's the rest of our priors, right? We're going to say that the average uh, wait time across cafes is going to be five minutes in the morning with a standard deviation of two, right? We're going to, so we need those population averages, right? So we need to put priors on those. We don't know what these are. We're going to estimate them from the data, right? So this thing is going to pull information from the data in combination with a prior, right? To then sample out those, those, those um, intercepts and slopes for each cafe. So we're going to put that 5-2 prior on alpha, the average wait time across all cafes. And we, remember, we know what this is. We set it because we simulated it, right? We set it at 5. Um, we're going to say beta is minus 1 with the standard deviation of 0.5. Again, we know that. We set it, right? Uh, and we're going to put exponentials on all our variance parameters, right? And those are just the... So sigma here is the sampling... Uh, sampling standard, this is the standard deviation of wait times. We can think of these as the difference in wait times within a cafe, right? So how different are wait times if I were to return to the same cafe at the same time of day? How different will those wait times be from each other, right? Sigma alpha is how different are the intercepts across cafes. Sigma beta is how different are the slopes across cafes. And here we have a funky thing, this LKJ correlation prior. What this does Right, because R here is a correlation matrix, right? And a correlation matrix takes this form. So we need a sampling distribution for correlation matrices, right? And that's a difficult thing. You want to go hang out with me? Yeah. You want to say hi to people? No? No? Okay, bye. Okay. Um, we have not changed out of PJs yet. That's okay. Uh, it's Friday. Um, so this is a correlation matrix. We need a prior. We need a probability distribution that gives us correlation matrices, right? So that's kind of funky. Uh, the overthinking example box in the book gives you a lot of details on this probability distribution. I'm not going to go too far into it. Um, just know that um, an LKJ core one um, is kind of flat across the minus one one space. An LKJ two uh, has a bit less weight in the tails toward minus one and one. So it kind of pulls those correlations a bit toward zero, right? Uh, a one, if we if we truly think it could be anywhere between minus one and one, then uh, Putting a one as your shape parameter for the LKJ core is reasonable. But if we want to wait uh, away from the extremes, remember like minus one and one are perfect correlation. Those are really rare. Um, so we might want to use a two to kind of pull the weight away from the extreme in the prior. So that's typically what we're going to be using. Okay, uh, so right. Rho can take on values minus one to one. Higher values for the shape parameter makes the prior skeptical of those extreme values. Let's fit the model. You know, this, this looks pretty messy, right? But when we actually go to fit it, it's not going to look too much more complex than what we've already done. So we're going to allow weight to be normal, mu sigma. We're going to say mu is A cafe with an intercept for each one plus B cafe with a slope for each one times afternoon. Now here's where the multivariate normal kicks in, right? So we need to say that 
um, A cafe and B cafe, both indexed by cafe, are distributed multivariate normal with mean A and B, with correlation rho, and with standard deviations sigma cafe. Right? So we're going to give it uh, a vector of average parameters, a correlation matrix, and a vector of standard deviations. And we're going to allow those standard deviations to be equal in this point. This is going to give us a vector, but we're going to put exponential priors uh, of one on both of them. Then we need to put a prior for A, which is the average value of a cafe intercept, B, which is the average slope for a cafe, and then rho has that LKJ core prior. Okay, so while this, the, the only thing we've really changed here is in our uh, distribution for our uh, parameters, right? For our alpha and beta parameters, is we're giving those multivariate normals now. That's the big new addition here. And that is a little funky, right? You need to make sure that you're giving it a vector of the intercept and the slope. And when you uh, put it into the likelihood, make sure you give it a vector of means, the correlation matrix, and a vector of standard deviation, right? Which this notation will give us once it knows it's looking for a vector. Cool. Questions about how to fit this? No. Okay. So the um, the so the C A cafe and B cafe and then the bracketed cafe. What is? I'm just trying to wrap my head around because I can kind of see like two slopes, but they're learning from each other. But um, so the the bracketed cafe. What is that? Is that this? This that, right, that right there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. What that's gonna say is I have so just C A cafe B cafe. If I don't have that that bracket cafe notation, which because this is a factor variable, right, or an integer, what it's going to do is it's going to estimate two values for each cafe. So that mm -hmm. bracket okay. says this isn't just one vector, right? This is actually k vectors where k is the number of cafes. Right. Telling it okay. in okay. effect that we're going to get k uh, length two vectors or a matrix that's um, k by two. Okay. If that makes sense. If it doesn't, that's okay too. Uh, this is how we do it. That's another way to, you know, <laughs> but what that, what that notation is going to do is it's going to say, you're not just estimating one set of these, you're estimating K set of these where K is the number of values in this index. That similar to what we've done in interactions, right? And, in, and, and the same thing we did when we estimated that multiple intercepts, the varying intercept model, similar thing. But now, instead of indexing one value, we're indexing a vector, which gets kind of funky. And the output of this is going to get hard, too, because now we're going to get, you know, uh, a vector of matrix. We're going to get, uh, it's, it's going to be uh, effectively a list of matrices where we're going to have, you know, when we sample from the posterior, we're not going to get a thousand values. We're going to get a thousand correlation matrices, right? And that's kind of tricky to work with, but it'll be okay. Okay, so what the model tells us about rho, uh, and then I've plotted that with the prior and the posterior, right? So the dotted line here is our LKJ prior, right? And so it's pretty, uh, you can see kind of most of the mass is around zero. It's skeptical of values around minus one and one. And this is our posterior, right? So the posterior is telling us that we have about a minus 0.5 correlation between the two. That's the modal value on the posterior, right? That's where it's peaked. You know, the average is going to be maybe like a minus 0.4 or something like that, right? But that modal, that maximum a posteriori value is minus 0.5, which is what we we know to be the truth because we designed the simulation, right? Uh, so this tells us about the distribution of the correlation between the random effects which is pretty cool about, about the varying intercepts and slopes. Uh, this is one way we can kind of extract how correlated are these things with each other. So the adaptive prior shrinks each posterior estimate toward group averages through pooling information, right? So we, we saw this with intercepts last time, and we saw this with just kind of general regularization with Bayesian priors. 
Uh, but now we get it not just for intercepts, we get it for slopes too. So let's think about what that looks like. We're going to pool information on the correlation of slopes and intercepts by learning from the data. We're going to pool information on the distribution of average wait times to estimate those individual wait times. Uh, and we're going to pool information on the difference between morning and after eight wait times to estimate individual differences. Those are effectively the three parameters that we want to learn about. Right? We want to learn about the correlation between them. We want to learn about the distribution of alpha, and we want to learn about the distribution of beta. And we're going to pool information across all observations on all of those. Um, so this is, if you want to work through this code on your own, I'm not going to talk through it too much. But this is, I'm going to set up a plot, and this is how I do it. Right? Um, so I take uh, you know, the Ds, I transform them into something tidy to run through ggplot. Um, I use the pivot wider code here. So if you want to kind of work through this and get an example of how pivot wider works, uh, maybe just run each line of code and then kind of see what, what they're doing over time uh, as, as you kind of progress through it. And then we're going to attach those samples from the posterior to it so we can plot it all out. Ooh, bad plot. Um, let me show you this because this one's kind of important, sorry. There's always one I forget to put the height on. Okay, so here's make sure my plot dat is set up appropriately. I'll recompile these in a bit. Um, okay, so here's what that looks like. So um, the black dots are the observed, right? So that's what we simulated out from the data. The blue dots are what we get from the model. And we can see that for all of the cases that are kind of far away from the center of the distribution, from the means, uh, what our model is doing is it's pulling in. So, so the, the x-axis here is the intercept, the y-axis is the slope. So this is an A by B plot. It's kind of funny to think about it this way. But uh, what we have here is the, the, the average wait time in the morning on the intercept and the difference between afternoon and morning up here on the slope. And so this is what that adaptive regularization is doing, is it's pulling in those extreme values a bit toward the middle. right? And it's not pulling them exactly toward the center across the board because we have correlation here. Remember that we can kind of imagine a line cutting through this, because we have that minus 0.5 correlation between A and B. But we can see that those extreme values are getting nudged in a bit, right? So when we have uncertainty about our data, right, we only have 10 observations from the morning and afternoon in each cafe. That's not a ton of information uh, when we think they all come from the same population. And so maybe we just hit it on a really bad day. Uh, we are going to, and, and what we're at really after is, um, you know, learning about cafes generally, not learning about one cafe in particular, uh, what this uh, technique of pooling the intercepts and slopes is going to do, right, is it's going to pull things in. It's going to nudge them in toward the group averages for beta and for alpha in this case. So this is just kind of a, a, the difference between the observed and the posterior, right, at least uh, the, 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 the mean for the posterior. Questions about this plot and what this is doing? Right? It's kind of pulling in those extreme values, same way our prior does, and same way we saw with slopes. Right? This is just another layer of regularization and shrinkage on our data. So um, if you had more data, would you expect that pooling to get smaller? Correct. Correct. The, well, the pooling would be the same, but the shrinkage would be smaller. Right, so let's just see what happens. Um, let's um, rerun my simulation uh, with in cafe. So let's say uh, in cafe is equal to uh, 20, but let's say we visit each of them 200 times. Okay, let's rerun this and see what happens. I'm going to have to recompile the model, so bear with me. But as you know, this can take a second. This is also going to spit out warnings that we can just ignore. Um, and that sometimes we're going to ignore them because we're using it not, you know, real worried about producing this for the scientific paper. 
Um, but yeah, so, so the shrinkage does get smaller with more data, for sure. And anytime you're ready, model, you can start sampling. This is so the the uh, slope and the intercept. I, I'm just wrapping my head. So basically, we're predicting time here. But can you just reiterate really quick what what am I looking at on the slope on that left hand side, and what am I looking at in the intercept here? So the intercept is the average wait time for a cat okay. in the morning, and the black okay. dots are what we uh, simulated. Those are the observed. Right. Those are the observed wait times uh, average right across cafes. And the beta mm -hmm. is the difference between the afternoon and the morning wait. Okay. Right. So uh, the beta is effectively how much less time do you wait in the afternoon, right? And that's why it's all negative because it's how much less time do you wait. Mm -hmm. um, so this okay. is morning waits, and this is the difference between morning and afternoon. Makes sense. Okay. So we we run all that. Now let's plot it all out. Okay, so now let's see what the shrinkage looks like. Okay, so when we compare here, we saw a ton of shrinkage, but when we get up to 200 visits per cafe, right, we have a lot of information now on each cafe, we see virtually no shrinkage, right? We can see still those extremes get nudged a little bit, right? But toward the middle, the blue dot and the black dot are basically on top of each other. So when we've got a lot of information, we still get some benefit here. And all the sort of benefits we get about uh, the modeling in terms of allowing time invariant predictors, in terms of estimating um, variance at multiple nested levels, in terms of doing all the things that multi-level models do, we still gain. Uh, but we don't see as much of the regularization because we have a lot of information, right? Uh, so we have more certainty that this cafe is in fact different from other cafes, right? In this context, so only this is... we may have more uncertainty about this cafe truly being different from others. But once we observe it more, right, we can have more certainty there. Go ahead. Oh, so, so no, I was gonna ask, so this, this approach also would then be really good to take care of outliers because it will not let them pull things too far but I don't have to ignore them. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. If you think an outlier okay. is, so like, don't delete outliers, right? Uh, but yeah, no, this is, I mean, so if we have an extreme observation, this is a great technique for dealing with it, right? Because we can say, well, it comes from the same population of things. And so maybe we want to kind of nudge our posterior inference uh, of it a bit. And if it is truly extreme, that's fine, right? It can, we can observe extreme values, but this is a way for us to kind of nudge them. Yeah. This is a great way to deal with heterogeneity in your data. And and even if we had a lot of data, if we had a very extreme, it would still pull it uh, a lot uh, or more, but it, more. It might put, so it'll, it'll say that there's more variance in the uh, distribution of slopes and intercepts, but it's fine. There's, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Um, you know, the other thing you could do is instead of using a normal, if you think that, you know, you have, um, you know, a lot of tail cases, right? And you, you're worried about your parameters getting pulled. You could use a student's T, right? Instead of a normal, because the student's T has thicker tails than the normal. And there's, and it's symmetric. It follows other, uh, you know, similar properties to a normal in other ways. So instead of putting a normal, uh, a multivariate normal uh, distribution for alpha and beta, we could use a multivariate student's T. Would you do the same thing here then uh, as what we've done before, where you can say, I'm going to do this with this distribution or that distribution? Like, would you put a gamma in there or something like that if you felt like that was appropriate? Of course. Yeah, for our life. So the same, yeah, we, we, so the same generalization that I did, that you did with the other models, you can do here. Correct. Right. This approach extends to Poisson, extends to gamma, extends to negative binomial, extends to zero inflated models, extends to whatever. You could define your own likelihood distribution, right? Um, all we're doing, right, because the likelihood for the data is the same as we've used in the past, right? We're here, we're giving a normal likelihood on the data, right? Wait times are normally distributed. The only thing we're doing is we're putting these hyperparameters into the model, right? 
So we have uh, the parameters now where alpha and beta have their own parameters, right? Alpha cafe and beta cafe have a, uh, a variable uh, amount of covariance and uh, have population average parameters that we're also going to estimate from the model. But there's no reason that I couldn't use a Poisson or a binomial or a gamma or any other likelihood for this approach. Yep, that's fine. Um, I typically use these models a lot with Poissons. I use them all the time with Poissons. So yeah, no, I mean, it, it, this generalizes. And I was going to include a binomial example. Uh, my, I, I, I kind of ran out of time in my prep to get that in, so I apologize. I may, if, if there's interest in showing a GLN version of this, right? So this is a linear model, a Gaussian model, uh, but I can maybe work an example in lab on Tuesday that would show you this with a Poisson. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, do, I'll do an example from my own research uh, of this approach. Um, so I, I've used this approach for modeling police killings, and so I could show you how I did that. Um, okay, cool. I, I have another question, if I may. Sure. Um, when you when you talked about changing the the distribution, you said you're going to change the distribution for the uh, likelihood. But then, do you have to change the the multivariant as well, or is that just no. how does that work together? Because you had the MV normal there. Yeah, yeah. So that's just the distribution for my slope and intercept parameters. So if the likelihood of my data, right, and we're using a link function to take the likelihood of the data and convert it onto a linear scale, there's no reason I can't use normal distributions for my intercepts and slopes in a Poisson model, right? Because the we, we're using that link function to take our linear component of the model and turn it into linear, right? We're converting it between the likelihood, in this case, exponential space, and the linear space of our model. Once we're in the linear space of our model, a normal distribution actually makes a lot of sense for those intercepts and slopes. And it would in a logit model too, right? Because remember, once we're in the logit model, uh, the inverse logit can take on values between minus infinity and infinity. Or the, uh, the exponential model can take on those, right? So, so the link function takes something that's on the minus infinity to infinity continuous space and converts it into whatever space we need for our likelihood function. So using the multivariate normal still makes sense, even if we're in a Poisson or a binomial model. Using the multivariate as the distribution for our varying intercepts and slopes is still a reasonable thing to do. Are there any conditions where you would say, I should not use that normal? Precisely. Uh, multivariate uh, no, normal? Yeah, no. When If you think that you've got a lot of extreme values, then something like a student's T, a multivariate student's T or something might make sense. There okay, is, so uh, one, there, there's a so book that covers this really nicely uh, that, that uh, describes why we use the Gaussian or normal prior for multivariate. But go ahead. No, no, that's, that's what I was going to ask. Is that, as I said, like, so you make these, the two considerations for in, any one of them based on the one you expect. And that's, so when you were saying the T, you were actually talking about using the student T was actually for the covariance for the distribution of for the multivariate distribution of the um, varying parameters the intercepts and the slopes yeah so i could have a poisson likelihood and then a multivariate students t for the distribution of alpha and beta hypothetically you know if you're worried okay. about extreme values kind of um pulling your inference then that's something you could do because there's more inherent variation in the student's T than there is in a normal. The tails are much fatter. Okay. Are you usually just going to... Is it... Are you usually going to... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Last one, though. Are you usually then going to negotiate between the normal and the student T, or are there any other distribution that you might consider? I'm normally going to use the normal. I have never hit a case where I've worried about using a student's T. Um, this, I, I, I think you're, you're kind of overthinking this. The normal is typically just fine for the distribution of intercepts and slopes. If you're really worried about it, the student's T is going to be a good alternative. If you want to get clever and do something fancy, you, you know, should feel free to get clever and do something fancy. There's no reason you couldn't do something else. Um, it's just not the 
um, you know, maximum entropy solution to the problem. If you're motivated, if you have a strong motivation to do something else, go for it. Um, but that's not something I have a lot of experience with. I'm typically just kind of writing with the normal. I think it, it covers most cases pretty well. Uh, okay, now oh, that plot looks better. Um, okay. So why don't we take five and we'll come back. I have 11.09 on my clock. Let's come back at, uh, when I say five, I mean three. Let's come back at 11.12. So, back at it. Um, okay, let me just like take a second. How do we feel about this? Do we have what like on a scale? Uh, like, uh, you know, what what questions do y'all have about how this all works? Okay, cool. Well, maybe it'll maybe you'll have more questions as we go through examples. Uh, so we're gonna take the rest of the lecture and work uh, work through the Gapminder data again, um, just as a kind of worked example of how to put this into use. Um, the thing I want you to kind of come away with is that the basic principles of what we're doing here are not that different from what we've been doing all along, right? That we're gonna, you know, think about how these relationships are structured. We're gonna think about groupings in the data. We're gonna think about patterns that might be going on, and then we're gonna use this new tool instead of our old tools to put intercepts and slopes where we think they belong. Right? It's not fundamentally different from what we've been doing, with the exception of adding this additional complexity. Right? Of adding this adaptive prior in, of adding this kind of uh, prior with a covariant structure and adding this kind of joint distribution. And that's, that's the complexity. But in principle, in terms of how you think about these things and how you design your models, they're not that different. Okay, so here's the life expectancy data again. Uh, so, right, we um, are going to center and scale our life expectancy measure, right, so that it's going to have mean zero in a standard deviation unit because working on the, you know, years scale is kind of funky. Uh, we're going to make sure country is a factor variable. And we're going to turn year from like 1952, 1957, 1962 into zero, one, two, three, four, right? Because um, that's easier to work with too. But, you know, they're all the same. They're just kind of rescaled. Uh, it's a linear rescaling, so it doesn't change the structure of the data at all. Um, just makes the fitting and the priors easier. Okay, so countries differ pretty dramatically in average life expectancy. We saw that last time, right? We have huge variation across countries in terms of what their average life expectancy is. Uh, and all countries, just about all countries, a few saw declines, saw life expectancy go up over time between 1952 and 2012. So generally, we saw a positive increase in life expectancy over those 60 years. Uh, but the rates of increase differed across places, right? Uh, we can kind of go back to the first slides to see that. Right? The rate of increase, so that, that kind of average level across countries is pretty different. And the rates, the slope on these lines is different across countries, right? And it's not dramatic differences. We we don't see there's a couple of negatives, but they're, you know, for the most part, they're positive and they're similar in magnitude, but there are differences there. So let's think about those differences for a sec. Uh, so why might rates of increase differ across places, right? So if I start at a high value of life expectancy in 1952, there's not a lot of room to grow. There's a natural limit on how high human lives can be, right? Uh, you know, you don't hear about a whole lot of 150 year old. Um, so, you know, humans have a finite lifespan. So there's only so high the average, you know, lifespan can go in a country. Um, so if you started at 78 years in 1952, you may go up to 82, right? But that's going to be about as high as it can naturally go. So there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a ceiling effect here, right? Those countries that started at a high level cannot actually go that much higher. 
Countries, on the other hand, that were pretty low at the start of the period had a whole lot of room to grow. So we might expect there to be um, a negative correlation here, uh, that those countries with high initial growth should see slightly, not necessarily negative slopes, but should see slightly lower slopes than those countries with low initial levels, right? That there should be a correlation here between the levels the the average level of the slope and or the average level of, of, of the country and how fast it raised goes over time um, and co yeah so so we had you know much higher potential gains in those low life expectancy countries compared to those high life expectancy countries at the initial period so we might think that there's a relationship between these intercepts and slopes and this is a good motivation for the multi-level approach in addition to not wanting to fit 150 within unit models and, you know, all we talked about with overfitting and losing information when we do that. So here's the model I propose, right? Life expectancy is normally distributed with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, right? Now, standard deviation sigma is just the sampling variance within a country, and that's going to have that exponential prior, but mu is going to get our linear model, right? where we get alpha for each country and a beta for each country, and beta for each country is interacted with year, right? So that beta uh, provides us a slope over time with year. So effectively, we, we get an intercept for each country and a slope for each country. We're gonna allow those to be multivariate normal with means alpha and beta that we're gonna estimate from the data and we're gonna give priors, right? So we're gonna put a prior distribution, and remember this is mean centered and scaled. So, you know, the average life expectancy in the globe on the globe is zero according to between 1952 and 2012, and you know the the distribution ranges from about like minus 2.5 to about two, right? So this normal these normal priors cover all possible values, and then we're gonna put this covariance matrix S in, uh, where R is gonna get a prior, this LKJ prior, and sigma alpha and sigma beta are going to get the same exponential one prior, right? So the parameters we're estimating from the model are the intercept and slope for each country, the average intercept for each country, and the average slope for each country, the within country standard deviation sigma, the standard deviation of country averages, how different countries are from each other on average, and the standard deviation of slopes across countries, in addition to the correlation between alpha and beta, right? Out of this LKJ core prior, we're really just interested in that row, that correlation between alpha and beta in this context. And we have two varying parameters. I'm gonna pause a sec, let y'all think about this specification. There's a lot here. Questions about, that... yeah, go ahead. Yeah, with the LKJ core, the two with that pull towards zero or away from zero? Sorry, I don't remember. That pulls towards zero. Remember that um, the shape of that prior we saw before is this dotted line, right? Okay. So minus one and one are perfect correlation, right? Zero means no correlation. So this prior is pretty flat over the minus one one space, but it downweights extreme probability. It downweights extreme correlation. So it's saying, I don't really know where this is, but I'm pretty sure it's not one or minus one. That's what this prior says. Um, I don't think these are going to be perfectly correlated with each other. The most likely value is no correlation, but I'm not too certain about that. Thank you. Yep. So would that count as a more conservative prior then? It's a weakly informative prior. It's a weekly informative prior. A more conservative, if I, if I wanted to be conservative and I thought, no, I, I really don't think that there's going to be much correlation here, I could use an LKJ core four, right? And you could experiment with those priors if you like. If I increase the, the shape parameter in LKJ core, it increases the peak in the middle of that distribution at zero. So it's, it makes those extreme values less and less likely. That's more conservative. So feel free to kind of experiment with plotting out densities for LKJ core, right? We could go back here and 
just change this k equals 2, eta equals 2. I think in this case, eta is the shape parameter. Uh, you could change that out to 4 and see what you get with the density. The book also walks you through some different shapes of this distribution. It's a bit funky. I think using a default of a 2 is fine. And if you really are like, well, maybe they are extreme, use a 1. Um, the 2 is a weakly informative prior, and that's going to regularize things in the way we typically want, and that's good enough, unless you have strong information about what the starting correlation is between these things. I wouldn't typically use a 1, right, because correlations of minus 1 and 1 in data are incredibly rare. Other questions about this model? Again, just kind of trust me on the specification for S here, right? This is the matrix multiplication of the diagonal of the standard deviation vector times the correlation matrix times the diagonal of the correlation vector. We'll make sure we get the variance on the diagonals, but it's, it's a bit funky, but just kind of roll with it. Did y'all catch the whiff of Paw Patrol coming through my microphone? Uh, that's pretty exciting. Um, okay, no. Okay, cool. Um, so this is our model. Let's fit it. All right. Uh, apologies that popped off there, but it's just sigma country, and then the parentheses closes there. Um, okay. So similar to what we did before, uh, life expectancy is normal mu sigma. Mu is alpha country plus beta country times year. Right. We have a joint distribution for alpha and beta each of which is indexed by country. So we get an alpha and a beta for each country, two values for each country, multivariate normal. Uh, here, I'm gonna allow alpha to be zero, the average for each country to be zero because I scaled and centered it. So it will be centered at zero. I artificially did that right outside. So I can estimate one fewer parameter, which is makes sampling easier. Um, if you scale and center a variable, you can set one of those, uh, usually your intercept parameter to be zero. Um, and in and, and, and a lot of multi-level modeling packages, they constrain the distribution of intercepts and slopes to be equal to zero. So you'll get one parameter for the population and then deviances from the population. And that's, that's similar to what we're doing here. It's just a different parameterization of it. It's equivalent. Um, if that was confusing, don't worry too much about it. Uh, right. Beta has a normal 0, 2. I don't need a prior for the average for intercepts because I've fixed it at 0. Uh, but I do want priors for the standard deviation of the slope and intercept terms, which is going to be sigma country, which is going to give me a vector of 2. Sampling distribution within countries over time. And the LKJ core 1 here, I just allowed it to be totally flat. A 2 is fine. I'm sorry, I had it represented as a 2 there and put it in as a 1. It, the model sampled fine, so it didn't hurt me, but I could go back and change that in future iterations. Okay, so here's what we get, right? Um, we get an individual line for each country. And we can see that those are matching the country trajectories pretty well, right? We allow each one to have um, you know, its own intercept, and we allow each one to have its own slope. And our idea about kind of initial positions and final positions affecting the magnitude of slopes appears to be right. So like if we take Canada, right, they started above average, they were above zero at 1952, and they finished you know, at about 1.5 standard deviations above the mean. So they saw a 1.5 unit growth. But if we compare, for example, Bolivia, they started at like minus 1.5 standard deviations below the mean, and they finished at about 0 0.5 standard deviations above the mean. So they had a growth of two, right? So they had higher growth than Canada uh, because they started lower, right? And Canada couldn't go too much higher than where it started. We see a similar pattern in Nicaragua, Mexico, right? Uh, in the Dominican Republic, you know, in some of these countries that had low life expectancy at the beginning of the period, they saw tremendous growth in life expectancy over this period, where we see less pronounced growth in the United States and in Canada, in Argentina, in some countries that already had relatively high life expectancy compared to the other countries in the Americas. Yeah? Clear what the varying slopes are doing here, right? Similar to what we saw at the beginning, 
where we fitted a slope to each country, but now we're pooling information and we can pull out information on the variance of those slopes as well. Um, just so we can kind of internalize what this means, here's a model where now I don't have a varying slope on country. I'm just going to estimate one fixed slope of increase across all countries in the world, but they still get their own intercept, right? So I don't have the multivariate normal prior anymore. What does this do? Right now, this is what the inference for that looks like, where I estimate a single slope for all countries. And we can see that the fit is a lot less, uh, you know, kind of it, it, that, that we've underfit the data relative to what we could have done. Right. Our inferences about the United States are that we predicted that it was too low at the start of the period and too high at the end of the period. Right. Because those countries that were already relatively high have shallower slopes. At the same time, these countries that were relatively low, right, are outperforming. We're, we're under predicting Peru, right? We over predicted where it started in 1950 and we under predicted where it ended in 2012, right? Because the slope we provided for Peru based on that uh, completely pooled estimate is too shallow. So it's too steep for these countries with high starting values and too shallow for those countries with relatively low starting values, like El Salvador or Guatemala, right? That we see that we're under predicting on the right hand side and over predicting on the left hand side. We have the opposite problem for Canada, where we're under predicting on the left and over predicting on the right. As opposed to this model, that gets these trajectories pretty well dead on. So the variable slopes model, right, it's still, you know, regularizing those priors. So we're not going to overfit the data, right? It's going to pull them in a little bit toward the mean. But in this case, we've got 12 observations on each country and the patterns are pretty consistent. So we get really good estimation of these trajectories. Let's just see how we do for a continent that's not the Americas. I picked the Americas because there are fewer countries there but let's see how well it works if we switch to say asia there's a lot of diversity across asia okay and the model's doing really well here too plot zoom there you are all right right uh this can take a second to draw. The model's doing pretty well here. Uh, you know, we have a war in Cambodia, right, that drops life expectancy pretty dramatically. Um, you know, we have kind of periods of instability that fluctuate uh, life expectancy in some places. Um, but we can see that we're doing really well in terms of fitting, uh, you know, the, the growth trajectories of each of these. You know, there, we're seeing some places right here as a war period. And, you know, that's devastating that we see kind of flattening or decreasing life expectancy in the aggregate as a function of conflict. But, um, you know, maybe we want to put a nonlinearity in here, but the line seems to actually be doing really well. Uh, and again, let's compare this to what we would get with a single line. Um, so, bring back our CV. Uh, so the single line model, single global line is here. Ah, it doesn't have the model in. I'm not going to make you wait for the compilation on that, but we get the idea. Um, let's, let's take a look at how it does. The couple of places where we saw declining life expectancy were in Africa, and let's see how the model does there. I break it out by continent just because it's too much to look at otherwise. Um, okay, so the, we saw that in the uh, within unit model, we had a couple countries, uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, where we see on average a decline in life expectancy, again, driven by conflict and war. Uh, here we might see places where a nonlinearity would help us in fitting these models, but it's doing okay, right? 
We're allowing for slopes that have relatively high growth, like Algeria. We're allowing for slopes that have small negative growth, like Zambia. And we're allowing for slopes that are relatively shallow, like Tanzania, right? So this variable intercepts and slopes approach is really flexible in terms of allowing us to fit trajectories that make sense for each country while not running the risk of overfitting. And the other thing we can do here is we could pull out the average country and we could say what on average was going on across the globe over this period and how different were country growth trajectories from each other. That's something we couldn't do in the no pooling approach. So uh, just to compare it to, right, there's that. Now, if we take um, the sigma values out, what we can think about is how different are countries from each other on the intercept and how different are they from each other on the slope. So this first value here is our um, variance for alpha, right? This is the sigma value for alpha. Uh, I guess this is actually a standard deviation. Uh, so on average, the countries are, you know, about one unit away from each other, right? Um, which is pretty high variance on the standard deviation. And the slopes have a lot less variance in them, right? That, you know, when we look at the distribution of those slopes uh, relative to the distribution of the levels, right? Taking the case of the Americas, the slopes are not super far apart from each other. Now, of course, this is going to be applied over time. So we, this is a 0.06 average unit change per five years in standard deviation. So over 12 years, this is going to work out to about a 0.3 you know, growth over time on average, or difference in growth trajectories over time across units. But you know, this, this is um, not, we don't see, we see so, so the way to think about this is we see more variation in the level of each country than we do in the growth rate of each country. Right, this is our standard deviation for beta. This is our standard deviation for alpha. So there's a lot of variance in the level that each country's at, not a ton of variance in the growth trajectory for each country. And the thing that maybe we would want to add into the model is a predictor for war and conflict, right? That seemed to be a big driver of what uh, was affecting the growth trajectory. So if we did something like that, we could probably do quite a bit better here. Questions on interpreting these variance parameters? We could think of this as how tight or narrow that sampling distribution for alpha and beta are. Remember this guy, right? This is our multivariate normal. And in here, right, we have kind of width on alpha and width on beta. And we're thinking about how wide is the distribution that we're drawing alpha from and how wide is the distribution that we're drawing beta from? How wide is it on the y or on the on the y axis here versus on the x axis? That's what those parameters tell us. Uh, I, I have one question off of that about the nonlinear fitting that you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the data looks like it does very well with linear and some could have done with nonlinear. And how do I navigate that? Because, like, or can I put some kind of flexibility that will allow both in a way? So I have beta country times year. I could very easily have a gamma country times year squared. If I wanted to and allow for there to be a quadratic term, I could add a second varying slope term, this time with a quadratic on year. To allow right, but the, the collection point and curve. The, the question was, uh, the, so the question is like, if I do that, would it then still, if the, if it's very linear, would it just make those very small for those countries yeah. and basically make those more linear and the others will be allowed to play with the nonlinear? That's right. Okay. We'll that's... Each country to have its own quadratic term. And for most countries, it'll be very close to zero. For a few countries, it will be more pronounced. Uh, and the variance on that, I suspect, would be very close to zero. I suspect it wouldn't actually estimate very many non-zero quadratics. And when we see something, so in this case, you know, on the scale of our outcome, 0 0.06 is close to zero, but it's not zero. If I saw, you know, the variance, if I estimated a third, um, 
uh, varying term here, that quadratic term, and it was like the variance of it, the sigma value for it was like 0 0.0001 or something like that. And that would tell me that it's not really contributing much, that those, those, those terms are not varying across countries, and so they're probably not contributing much to my fit. And that's probably just extra complexity that my model doesn't need. I, instead, if I saw, you know, that that quadratic term had a variance that was, uh, you know, 0 0.05, and I'd be like, okay, that's helping me fit my model. There are differences across countries in this way. Let's leave it in. Uh, these, these kind of variance parameters in your multi-level models are really helpful for thinking about how different are countries from each other, right? How different are my units from each other? And in this case, in terms of their baseline levels, they are incredibly different from each other, right? They are, on average, one standard deviation different from each other because we're in standard deviation scale. Uh, and over time, we don't see tremendous differences, but there are meaningful differences, right? So when, you know, when we looked at these slopes, they weren't swinging all over the place, right? And even if we go to the, you know, uh, looking at the subset from Africa, they're, they're not, we're not ranging from minus one to one on our slopes, right? We're ranging from like 0 0.5 to like minus 0 0.01. So it's a pretty narrow band that we're varying across. Um, you know, and we can, if we wish, right, extract all of those, uh, it just gets to be a lot of parameters to look at. Um, we can see the individual country intercepts and slopes um, with a depth equals three, right? These alphas, these betas are the slopes for every single country. That's for country one, that's for country two. So then we can simulate out, okay, where is this country going to go next year? But we can also simulate a new country. Right, because we know the distribution of country intercepts and slopes now. Right, um, we can't do that in the no pooling approach. So there's the, all the betas for each country. Here's all the alphas for each country. Right, uh, and then if we kept going down in those extra 126 rows, we would get our sigmas and our and our rows as well. Lots of parameters, uh, but we don't have the trade-off of degrees of freedom that we do in a typical regression, where we can only estimate right. Uh, you know, it, it, what, n minus one parameters. Uh, we, we can actually estimate more parameters than we have observations in a multi-level approach, right? Uh, because we're pooling information, right? And all these alphas are sampled from a distribution. They're not just fit to those 12 observations. So we can actually estimate a lot of times in a Poisson model, I'm gonna fit a random effect to each observation to model over dispersion. So I'm gonna get, if I have 10,000 data points, 10,000 uh, varying intercepts. Plus, maybe I want to add country level variation on top of that. So I could have 10,000 plus those 150 countries, right? And, it, and it's fine. It sounds crazy, but we can end up with models with tens of thousands of parameters and they'll fit just fine because we're partially pooling information. In a classical context without a multi level setup, we can't do that. Okay. Um, so I had a quick question. Um, if you were to factor by, I guess, like continent, like part of the homework was about like groupings versus individualized, like IDs, so forth. Would that be impact? Like, I'm assuming like it'd just be the same impacts here. Or... <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so we did that last time, right? Where we added right, exactly. the random effect for continent. And what it's going to do mm -hmm. is it's going to shrink some of the variance on the country level intercept, right? Because continents are similar. Right, right. Okay. Soak right. up some of that variation. That's a nested random effect, a nested mm -hmm. intercept. It's fine. That's fine. Okay. Because remember, in this approach, we can use time invariant features of units. Right now, if I were not doing varying intercepts, I could not do that. Right, I, I wouldn't have enough degrees of freedom to estimate that. But in this context, I can. So then I could kind of ask how much of that country variation is explained by continent level variation. Definitely can do that. And then I could add country level predictors in as well. I could add a lot more complexity to this. Yeah. And you just kind of have to think about how to specify that model. But definitely doable. Okay. The book covers a lot more here. Um, it gets pretty technical, so I didn't want to go too far down there. Um, but uh, if you're interested in how to apply the multi-level modeling techniques to questions of causal inference, I highly recommend you check it out. 
there's a good section on instrumental variables approaches using this approach in the book. Um, uh, in addition to a couple other topics that include a Poisson model and a binomial model. So if you want to check those out, I encourage you to go through and work those examples. Um, they include a lot of raw STAN in the models, so I didn't want us to introduce too much additional coding complexity when this is already complicated enough. Um, so, and again, I'm going to show you how to do this in a slightly less cumbersome way next time when we'll use the BRMS and the LME4 packages to fit multi-level models. Um, okay, so to summarize, right, we can use partial pooling for slopes just like we did for intercepts. This treats both the intercepts and slopes as coming from that same population, right? That they are coming from a joint multivariate normal distribution and that they have a sampling distribution that is estimated by using the full population of countries or whatever unit we're after, cafes, right? Um, and when our units are exchangeable, right? When our units are actually coming from the same population and the only thing that sets row one from row two apart is just what order it is in the data frame, right? There's nothing inherent about that order. It's just arbitrary. The sequencing, uh, when they come from the same population, this makes a ton of sense to pool information like this. Um, it should be our default approach when we have clustered data, right? When we have this kind of multi level structure to our data, we should use these kinds of models. Um, you know, this is going to take you a while to get your head around, and that's fine. This is complicated stuff. The more you work with it, um, I think the more it'll start to click. So I do encourage you to look at those easy and medium questions from chapter 14 and hard one if you want a challenge. Um, you know, the easy and medium questions though should be something that if you can work through those, you'll have your head around the basics here. Um, and again, we'll kind of work through some simpler applications for this next time, um, including a real world example from my work. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we're, we're, we're approaching the end, and I'm sorry that I um, misbudgeted time and we won't have the full lecture to go over missing data approaches. I will cover that in lab on Tuesday, and then next Friday will be the final lecture where we'll talk about um, translating what we've learned into both frequentist, you know, uh, applications with generalized linear models and multi-level models, but also Bayesian applications using um, some packages that have um, put a lot of convenience onto using STAN. Um, so ULAM is a nice way to use STAN. It's much easier than writing raw STAN, but there's even easier ways to do it. So we'll, we'll cover those next time. Um, yeah, if there are topics that you really wanted to make sure we covered and I, we didn't have time for over the semester, throw them on the Slack and I, I will see what resources I can track down for you all on those. But any questions about the material today? No? All right, well, stay well, and I will see you all on Tuesday. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be checking the Slack as we go too. All right, bye everybody. And Asan, I'll 